think my sister's right. Her husband is paranoid. Over the past few years, I've watched his erratic behavior, favoring those who pander to his wishes, striking out at those who don't, changing his mind on fictions, not fact. Don't get me wrong, Herod's a great man and an able king. What he's done for Jerusalem through the years is astounding. Just rebuilding the temple was a magnificent feat. Through that act alone, he endeared himself to many Jewish leaders, myself included. Yet he's no exemplar for Jewish piety. He wades too far into pagan customs, watering down his Jewish upbringing. Herod offends the Pharisees and the Sadducees alike in spite of restoring their glorious temple. But recent days have seen a darkening of his mood. His anger burns no matter what's happening. My sister Mary Amney tells me she is frightened of him. I too am concerned. And I'm not naive enough to think that either one of my titles, high priest or brother-in-law, will carry much weight with him if put to the test. So I, like many others around him, keep my head down. I go about my business in the temple, hoping that he'll stay in his palace and not look in my direction. Rumor has it he's already killed three of his own sons, and I want to keep my position of power. I've worked hard to be where I am, and I plan to stay here, high priest of the temple, for many years to come, whatever it takes. The last of the sun dips below the horizon. The stars begin to rise. Among them, a star burns brighter than the others. I've asked the royal astrologers about it, but they have no good explanation. Its appearance has me going back to the scriptures, reading and rereading the prophecies that I long ago ceased to believe. We've waited too long for the Messiah. God has no intention of saving us. Even so, the words of the prophet Micah stick in my mind. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. My eyes sweep toward the south as I ponder the possibility and the improbability of Bethlehem. This is a prophecy that can threaten many, including me. I'm more aware than ever that my fate is tied to Herod's. I get up from the table where I've been studying the Torah for the past four hours. My eyes are weary, my back is stiff. Crossing to the window, I look out over the city of Jerusalem. I turn back to the table, and I realize the summons from King Herod still sits unanswered. And I remember that his messenger stands just outside my door. Apparently foreigners, magi, have arrived from the eastern countries, and they're asking about one who's been born King of the Jews. It's an ominous occurrence. To say that Herod was rattled by the inquiry would be a gross understatement. His fear will intensify just below the surface until it erupts, likely in some form of destruction. I don't want to answer the summons, but I know that it's not within my power to refuse a king. So I slowly roll the manuscript that has the prophecy about Bethlehem on it, and I walk toward the door. In the back of my mind, I wonder what could possibly save me from Herod's paranoia. Will it be our kinship? Will it be how his power over Jerusalem intersects with my power over the temple courts? Will it be giving him a target for his fear? As I walk toward the door, I'm not assured, and I'm no fool. I know my place in life is precarious right now. So I'll tread lightly, and I'll tell Herod what he wants to hear. And while I'm sure that there's no king of the Jews coming, I'll give Herod the city of Bethlehem, nonetheless.